Hi everyone. Thank you very much for joining us in our last talk from the Physio webinars. This is an event organized by grad students from the Physiology Graduate Program of the Institute of Biosciences in the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And here you can see our team. We organized four very interesting talks that happened throughout October and November with speakers from different countries talking about different themes of physiology and their intersections with other areas. Please follow us to get more information or if you want to see the previous talks. For this last talk, we are very pleased to welcome here Dr. Barbara Woodside, who's a psychologist with a broad interest in understanding the mechanisms involved in pregnancy and maternal behavior. She got her PhD in psychology by the McMaster University and is a distinguished, distinguished emeritus professor from the Center for Studies in Behavioral Neurobiology at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, where she also got the title of Honorary Concordia University Research Chair. Using Rex as a model, her research focuses on understanding how the brain of a mammalian mother changes throughout gestation and lactation, allowing the mother to meet the needs of her offspring. Dr. Woodside, thank you very much for joining us today. And after your talk, we will have 30 minutes to answer questions from the audience. Everyone is welcome to ask questions in the YouTube chat, and if you prefer, they can be in Portuguese, and our team will translate them. This event will be recorded and will be available on YouTube after the transmission. So without further ado, I now pass the word to Dr. Bob Woodside, and our team will be in the background in case of any technical difficulties. Thank you, Diego. Um, it's great to be here this afternoon. Thank you for um, everyone. Oops. Thank you for everyone on the team for all the support I've got in doing this. This is a new experience for me. Um, I'm happy to be part of this group. I just wish that I was with you instead of in the snow. Um, so yes, my talk is going to be on uh, ghrelin and a potential role for ghrelin in the metabolic ad adaptations to lactation. Um, for mammalian, oops. Okay, one technical difficulty overcome. For mammalian females, uh, raising young is a complex and energy demanding task. Um, regardless of what sort of mammalian female you are, right? The length of the task, if you're an elephant or a human, you can look forward to sort of investing in your young for a very long period of time. If you're a rodent, it's a very, it's a much shorter period of time. But in general, mothers get involved in uh, ca taking care of their young, um, keeping their young warm. If you're a tiger, teaching them how to swim. Uh, protect, protecting them for pred from predators, etc. What we, um, when we think, I'm going to talk primarily about rodents this afternoon. And when we think of maternal rodent behavior, we have tend to think of images like this, right? Here's a mouse in the in the top left up here. There's a mouse mother surrounded by multiple offspring. She's engaging in grooming her offspring and particularly in anogenital licking. And you can see she's surrounded herself with nest material. And so we often think of these as being hallmarks of maternal behavior, building a thermal nest for your young and grooming them. And here, down at the, here we have a female rat. She's engaged in pup retrieval, the other, acid test of maternal behavior where the mothers will go out and retrieve the pups to the nest and um, thereby keeping them warm and keeping them available for feeding them. But these are all, we're talking about mammals here and we're talking about mat mammalian maternal behavior. And the characteristic of mammals is that they produce milk for their young. And often when we're thinking about maternal behavior, and it, we forget that providing milk for the young is a, is a key aspect of that behavior. And it's one that actually entails a great deal of energetic demand. This is a, uh, a female rat who's just given birth 
to her young. So these are, uh, and she, when these is a litter of eight pups and um, which is a, a fair size litter for, for rats. It's pro probably pretty much on the, on the lower end, but that litter of eight pups is about 20% of the mother's body weight. Here's the same mother two weeks later with the same eight pups. And you can appreciate, right, at this point, the pups are now almost as big as the mother is if in a, um, when you combine their weight. In fact, what the mother has done is she's actually grown about 80% of her body weight in two weeks by feeding those pups, right? It's a bit like asking you to uh, giving you free range at the supermarket and saying, okay, your task is to come back to me two weeks from today with something that is 80% of your body weight, right? And you have to remember that this feat on the part of the mother is, is made even greater by the fact that it's when she's providing milk to allow growth of her young to this extent, she's, the, the growth is net. That is that it's not like she's filling a balloon with nutrients. She's, she's giving nutrients to young that are expending energy. And what, so the 80% increase in dam weight, in litter weight, sorry, let me say that again. The fact that she has increased her, um, the weight of the pups by 80% of her own body weight is actually an underestimate of the amount of energy that she has to, um, that she's got to supply to the young in that time. Because during that two weeks, they're going to be moving around they're going to be thermoregulating to a limited extent. They're going to be um, defecating and urinating. So this is really a stupendous a task for the mother. And the question is, how does she deal with it? And she deals with it much the way that you would deal with a huge expenditure of your own, right? Whether it's an expenditure in terms of money or an expenditure in terms of energy, right? She um, uses the fat that is stored in pregnancy. So you, you use whatever you've got available to you. And for the um, female rat, it's fat in the initial is thing you can use is fat stored in pregnancy. And if you look, down here at this, um, this graph in the bottom left down here, um, you can see that females come into, this is peritoneal uh, fat pad weight. So it's the sum of retroperitoneal fat and parametrial fat. And um, so she comes into lactation with a fair amount of fat stored away during pregnancy. And over the period of time, that she's primarily responsible for um, milk production and the growth of her young, she's using up this fat store. And she uses about 50% of her fat uh, over this two week period, right? She also uses the calcium that she stored during pregnancy. We often don't think about this, but actually skeletal calcium increases across pregnancy. And uh, then that calcium is utilized for milk production during lactation. Along with this, she, she makes the most of what of the nutrients available to her by increasing the absorptive capacity of the gut. Um, now, she obviously doesn't say one day, I'm going to increase the absorptive capacity of the gut. This is something that happens as a function of many of the uh, hormonal changes that occur uh, in pregnancy. 
so she's she's getting better at utilizing all of the nutrients available to her. And at the same time, there are switches within the metabolic pathways of the female that ensure that any nutrients available are going to go to the young um, in the form of milk. So there's a decrease in lactation, there's a decrease in insulin sensitivity in a number of organs, including uh, white adipose tissue and uh, muscle. At the same time, there's an increase in insulin sensitivity in the mammary gland, which essentially means that the nutrients that are available are going to be channeled to the mammary gland and thereby channel to be the substrate for um, making milk, right? So you use what nutrients are available and you make sure that those nutrients are channeled towards milk. At the same time, what there are changes within the female, a metabolic uh, changes within the female that ensures that there's not going to be that she reduces uh, expenditure of energy in uh, unnecessary um, or in unnecessary activity. So there's a decrease in thermogenesis in brown adipose tissue. This means that calories are not going to be extended, expended in the form of heat, right? And at the same time, there's a suppression of um, reproductive, the reproductive axis, so that there will be um, the female, there will be no chance of an overlap between the current expensive, um, energy expensive investment in the current litter with having the next litter. And that's what this graph shows you. Essentially, what happens is that during lactation, the female becomes anovulatory. And that period of anovulation is a function of how much energy she has to um, expend in the current litter. So if she's got a small litter, then the length of anovulation is relatively short. In this case, um, it's about 17 days, 60, 17 days. Uh, but if she has a large litter, which is going to entail a greater energetic investment, then the, the length of it and the anovulatory period is increased to about uh, 25 days. And you can show, so that suggests that there's an energy dependent suppression of uh, the reproductive axis during lactation. And you can show that too, if you food restrict the female during lactation, you get a, a prolongation of this length of anovulation. Now, some species actually ovulate within 24 hours of giving birth. And rats are one of those species, actually. Um, so a rat will give birth um, well, on, the, on a regular day-night cycle, that is when they have light, when we have light, then the rats usually give birth between about 11 and two in the afternoon, 11 in the morning and two in the afternoon. They will often ovulate around five o'clock that afternoon. So that's within three or four hours of giving birth. I think this is heroic. Um, they ovulate at that time and now they can get impregnated in this postpartum uh, estrus. If they do so though, they delay implantation. And again, this is a litter size effect. So instead of implanting on day six, they may implant as late as day 14 after they got impregnated. Again, serving to offset the investment in the current litter and the investment in the next litter. Okay. Perhaps though, the most, the, the, 
change in behavior that we can actually see with respect to metabolism in lactation is an increase in food intake. And um, on this left panel here, you can see food intake during pregnancy when we often talk about people um, eating for, for two instead of eating for one. In rats, they're eating for 13 or 14 or 18 or 20, right? But even with that number, you can see that what they're doing, they're increasing their food intake by maybe 30 or 50% over the level seen in cycling, non-lactating females. Now look what happens in pregnancy, uh, sorry, in lactation, right? Food intake takes off so that at peak lactation, which is around day 14, this is just before the babies start, the pups start to eat on their own, the female can be eating as much as 350% of what she would eat when she was cycling, right? It's a huge increase in intake. And again, this is um, a function of how many pups she's nursing. So in this uh, graph, what you can see that if she has just a small number of pups, she shows a, a moderate increase in food intake. If she's, um, if, if she's got 16 pups, a large litter, she shows a much greater increase in food intake. Okay. Along, as you might expect, along with this change in intake, we, um, there are changes in the central pathways um, that control food intake. So this of you, for those of you who don't always look at the arcuate nucleus of, of rodents, this is a schematic of one in the non-lactating, the cycling, or even in male rats, um, right? Here's the third ventricle, here's the median emesence, and here's the arcuate nucleus, which we know is a central staging point for the um, neural circuitry that modulates food intake. There are also some, uh, here's the ventral medial hypothalamus and the dorsal medial hypothalamus, both of which have been implicated, albeit to a much lesser extent in um, the control of food intake. The two, what are often regarded as the two major uh, neuro, two major populations of neurons within the arcuate nucleus that control food intake are the neuropeptide Y agouti-related protein peptide neurons, so the NPY and AGRP neurons that are in green. These uh, stimulation of these neurons leads to an increase in food intake and the preopio melanocortin neurons, which I'm gonna call POMC neurons because otherwise it's impossible, um, which are involved in shutting down food intake. So these two, it, these two populations of neurons play central effects in the control of food intake. And these, two uh, populations are central to the peripheral um, signals of energy balance. Um, leptin is an anorectic peptide produced, a peptide hormone that's produced in fat. And um, estrogen, you're probably all familiar with as being the uh, major uh, a steroid, a gonadal steroid hormone in females. Estrogen, what some people forget, is a major anorectic hormone actually. So that's why they're both in red. Leptin and estrogen both act on these two populations of neurons to uh, shut down food intake. Whereas the glucocorticoids and uh, ghrelin are Erexigenic neurons, uh, erexigenic peptide hormones that act on um, NPY and POMC neurons, so as to uh, potentiate 
MPYs and AGLP effects and to suppress POMC effects. And then there are circulating neuron nutrients um, that also can influence food intake by actions in the arcuate. So this is what this um, system looks like in a non-pregnant, non-lactating animal, um, where there is a balance between these two um, populations of neurons. So a balance between food intake and uh, energy expenditure that allows one to maintain a, a reasonable um, body weight and pattern of food intake. If we look at what happens in the lactating animal now, though the situation becomes very different. What you find is that there is a much greater expression of both MPY, neuropeptide Y, and agouti related AGRP. I'm just going to use the acronyms right now. I hope that's okay with everybody because I can't see you nod, but maybe Diego would nod if he's okay. Yeah. And um, so there's a much greater relative expression of NPY and AGRP than there is of POMC. And um, so that the if you like to think about it, there is much, there's a, a greater proportion of, in, of um, circuitry that is going to be devoted to turning on food intake than there is to turn off food intake. And really, um, that is what you would expect given that the female has to eat so much. At the same time, you will see that NPY neurons have appeared in the dorsal medial hypothalamus. And this is to indicate that within this structure, there is the appearance in lactation of a population of neuropeptide Y expressing neurons or neurons that begin to express neuropeptide Y. And this is seen in lactating animals. It's also seen in some, um, in some models of, of, of gen genetic models of obesity, you see this same appearance of uh, neuropi neuropeptide Y expression within this same area of the dorsal medial hypothalamus. When we look at circulating signals controlling energy balance in lactation, we find also that there, um, the weights of the orexigenic peptides and anorectic peptides have shifted quite dramatically. So that with the decrease in body fat, as the female is using up her body fat to put into milk, then you get a parallel decrease in circulating leptin levels. So leptin is as I said earlier, is an anorectic hormone. So what we're doing is we're taking an anorectic break off the, um, off the system. Um, similarly, when we shut down reproduction during lactation, we're essentially ensuring that estrogen levels stay low. So that's another anorectic break that's taken off the um, the uh, food intake, right? So we're taking away two stop signals for food intake, right? In addition, we're increasing some go signals for food intake. Glucocorticoids are high. Basal glucocorticoids stay high through most of lactation. And so this tends to drive glucocorticoids, increase food intake, so that's going to put a positive drive on this system, again, increasing a GO system. And then my favorite hormone is prolactin. It's released by the suckling, stimula suckling stimulation from the pups. And it too is um, an orexigenic hormone. If you put prolactin into the brains, even of cycling animals, you'll increase their food intake. 
because most of the circulating nutrients are getting shuffled very efficiently into the mammary gland, there's going to be a decrease in circulating nutrients, which is also going to tend to uh, potentiate the activity of the um, orexigenic parts of this pathway. So the parts of the pathway that increase food intake. But what I wanted to talk this afternoon is um, about my second favorite hormone, perhaps. We were, ghrelin is, was discovered not too long ago and uh, was first um, discovered actually as the um, endogenous agonist of a growth hormone secrete growth receptor, but is primarily known as a, pe a peptide hormone that increases um, food intake. And so as my co, uh, my collaborator, my co-author on this talk, Alfonso Abzade, is uh, very much interested in ghrelin and has been part of the ghrelin story. The question we addressed with uh, the st studies I'm gonna talk about this afternoon is does ghrelin play an important role in the metabolic adap adaptations to lactation and particularly to the increases in food intake and lactation. So what about ghrelin? Okay, ghrelin is uh, not your average hormone. Um, it's a 28 amino acid peptide hormone. And it's interesting because it's produced primarily um, by the stomach, which we don't often think of as a, a glandular organ, but it does. Uh, secrete a number of hormones um, and ghrelin is produced in these XA cells in the stomach. It has a rather interesting um, life history. We start with the ghrelin gene and uh, which is transcribed into ghrelin mRNA, but then it's after translation, it is then pro, um, processed further. So you start with a pre-pro ghrelin. This is what you see in many hormones, whoops. Uh, sorry about that. But then in order to achieve its active form, the uh, pro ghrelin uh, has to be transformed to something called acyl pro ghrelin. And uh, it, it, the important, mover in this is a, an enzyme called GOAT, which is, um, has a long name and we don't need to talk about it, but it's a, it's a GOAT, it's a, um, and it actually, what the GOAT does is it puts this acyl group on one form of the, um, on one of the bases of the ghrelin molecule. So it's after becoming acyl pro ghrelin, then the, it's converted to acyl ghrelin. And this is regarded as the active form of ghrelin, okay? There is also a form that you find that is called unacyl ghrelin or desacyl ghrelin um, that is sometimes say, people say it's not active. It seems to have some uh, activity, but not through the same uh, receptor as acyl ghrelin. Acyl ghrelin is what I'm gonna be talking about this afternoon. And acyl ghrelin binds a, um, a receptor called the GHSR or the growth hormone secretor growth receptor. And um, as I said earlier, that was one situation where they found the receptor before they found the endogenous agonist. Okay. So um, one of the, the GHSR is a G protein coupled receptor. It's got some interesting, if not um, sometimes um, complex activity, uh, it's constitutively active, 
So unlike many receptors that just sit there on the membrane when they don't have their ligand bound to them, the GHSR is active up to about 50%, right? So it's signaling at about 50% of its capacity, even when it doesn't bind ghrelin. And um, it also forms heterodimers with an amazing number of other receptors, including the D1 and the D2. So it's quite a complex little molecule. There are ghrelin receptors throughout the um, central nervous system and the periphery, and um, there are ghrelin receptors in the pancreas, for example. There are ghrelin receptors in the stomach, plays a big role in um, controlling gastric emptying and gastric motility. There are ghrelin receptors on adipose tissue. Um, it's not a very, um, what's the, it, it, it acts in many different places and can influence uh, many different functions. This uh, complicated um, picture here is just to demonstrate that the number of factors that can stimulate ghrelin release from the um, cells of the stomach lining and uh, those that inhibit it, right? So the question was, does the peptide hormone ghrelin contribute to the metabolic adaptations to lactation? And the question we asked, how do you answer the question? So we went about asking this question in three different ways. First of all, we said, well, if you have a genetic mutation of the receptor, how does that affect lactation in female rats? And then we went on to ask whether, well, okay, that's the mutant. So how do the, uh, how do the changes in ghrelin levels and or ghrelin receptor expression change in wild type rats? And finally, we said, we got to the functional question. Well, is there a change in the ability of ghrelin to stimulate food intake in lactation? Okay, so this was the, um, in order to ask the question about the, um, if we truncate, if we change the GHSR gene, do we get a change in the behavior? We use this rat. So, um, it's one of the few models where you can get a receptor modification in a rat, which um, is why it was attractive for our studies. Um, one of the problems is the background that it's on is it's a fawn hooded hypertensive rat. So it's not uh, just a pale um, hooded rat. Um, and the mutation that it is produces a truncated form of the G of the GHSR receptor. And these rats um, eat less on a high fat diet. They don't walk around as much. They eat less of a palatable cookie dough after a, a dessert, after a meal. And that's one of the things that ghrelin is particularly good at doing. It, um, it tends to increase intake of high calorie sweet foods, high, high uh, carbohydrate dense foods. Um, these in the uh, males and in the cycling females, they don't have a reduction in their food intake. Um, they don't respond, however, to acute ghrelin administration by increasing their gastric motility. And you can see some of the, um, these are the strain that we, these are the animals that we had at Colton that we used. Um, Harry Mackay published this paper on them. You can see they don't show an increase in growth hormone or show a really suppressed release of growth hormone um, after ghrelin. Um, they don't, show up, sorry, they don't show a post fast food intake that's as big as that of the wild types. 
and they don't eat as much fat. So we thought, so they behave as though, yes, something has changed with the ghrelin, uh, the ghrelin receptor. Let's see what they do in lactation. And what we did was to use a cross fostering design to compare the outcomes of pregnancy and lactation. So in pregnancy, we just had wild type females and the knockout females. In lactation, we cross fostered pups. So we wanted to see if anything happened to food intake during lactation, was it because it was a wild type versus knockout mother, or was it because they were nursing wild type or knockout pups? If you had knockout pups that didn't suckle very much, maybe you'd attribute changes in food intake to the mother when in fact it was the pup. So pregnancy were just wild type and knockouts. Lactation, what we did was to take some knockout pups, give them to wild type mothers and some wild type pups and give them to knockout mothers. And because cross fostering tends to disturb everyone, we um, also cross fostered within genotypes. So between wild type, we moved wild type pups from one wild type mother to another, right? We did all these manipulations on day one postpartum and everyone ended up with about eight pups in a litter. Okay. And then we just watched and saw how they went through pregnancy and lactation. And these animals get pregnant readily. Um, there's no problem with mating and they carry through pregnancy. The only different, significant difference that we got was that they tended to put on more weight in the first half of pregnancy. The knockouts put on a bit more weight than the uh, wild types in the first half of pregnancy. That's something that we see in some experiments, not in all experiments, right? In the second half of pregnancy, they gain the same amount of weight um, they give birth to the same size litters, an average of 10 pups. This is a bit lower than you would expect to see in a Wistar, but it's um, about right for a fawn hooded. And the birth weight is not significantly different. The knockout pups tend to be a bit lighter, but it's something in the order of 0.4 of a gram. So it's, and it's not significantly different. Now we come to lactation, right? And as you can see here, the, okay, so what we have here are each of the four, four groups, so wild type moms nursing wild type pups, wild type moms nursing knockout pups, and so on. There's knockout moms, wild type pups, and knockout moms nursing knockout pups. And you can see that whether females were nursing wild type pups or knockout pups, they uh, ate less than the uh, wild type mums, right? And at the same time, they, the knockout mums gained less weight over the first two weeks postpartum than the wild type mums. Interestingly, given that there was a very little effect on um, litter weight gain. Um, it, there's a smidgen, it's not significant. You'll notice I've broken the bars here. Um, so the pups are, this is cumulative weight gain over first 40, 15 days postpartum. So from day one to day 15 um, after birth. And there's no significant effect, right? So it looks as though, what well, what I might be uh, tempted to conclude is that the uh, knockout mothers are eating less, but possibly lose using more of their own body fat to maintain um, the growth of their pups. The so was uh, we looked because it's a. Uh, an interest of mine, we also looked at the length of anovulation. 
in these uh, females. And you'll remember that I said earlier that females tend to shut down their reproductive function or at least their ovulatory, ovulatory function during lactation. And um, this period is extended in the, um, the knockout animals. Um, and it's extended whether as a function of the mother, so knockout mothers as a whole, regardless of who they're nursing, tend to have a slightly longer period of lactational anovulation than do wild type mothers. And then if you look only at the characteristic of the pup, nursing knockout pups tends to increase this period of lactational anovulation. Um, I think that the um, prolongation of the anovulatory period in the knockout mums may have something to do with the change in energetics that's imposed on her by the lack of um, the, the by the mutation in the ghrelin receptor. Um, not quite sure what it is with respect to the pups. So essentially, um, what we see with the um, effect of the GHSR mutation on lactation is that there's a reduction in maternal food intake and body weight. And that's really what you would expect if you've decreased or suppressed or got rid of a GHSR activity. Um, it's interesting that we're seeing this in the lactating females and you don't see it in the males of this genotype. Um, and that might suggest that the female rats, at least during lactation, are more sensitive to the erexogenic effects of ghrelin. I think that it's a lactation induced effect. Um, and there was an unexpected effect of the mutation on the length of anovulation. And it's unexpected because uh, conventional wisdom has it from a few studies, and I'll emphasize the few, that um, ghrelin inhibits the reproductive axis. Okay, I'm gonna rush on a bit because I seem to be running out of time. So we went on that to then to ask how ghrelin levels and central expression of uh, the receptor change during lactation. And uh, we looked at two time points, day 10 and day 14. And uh, we looked in lactating rats, cycling rats, obviously, who were not on postpartum, and animals that were postpartum but didn't have uh, a, um, didn't deliver any milk. And uh, so these, I'll rush through these. And these are the data that we got. Um, these animals, the GC animals are hormonally, they're suckled, the pups will suckle at a nipple and make her hormonally like a lactating animal, but we, we prevent her delivering any milk by cutting the tubes from the mammary gland to the nipple. And um, when we look on day 10 postpartum in these animals, we see that the circulating ghrelin is no different from in lactating from cycling animals. It's a little lower in the galactable cut animal. And we see increases in ghrelin receptor expression in the arcuate nucleus at least, not significant on day 10, but it's, uh, you see also a small increase in the ventral tegmental area, not in the hippocampus. And then when we look a little further in lactation, now we're at peak lactation and ghrelin levels have actually are now decreased in lactating versus cycling animals. The GC animals, so these, if, if you're suckled, so you're hormonally like a lactating animal, but you're not losing any energy to the mother, to the pups, then um, 
the ghrelin levels are identical to what they are in the cycling animal. There's a decrease in uh, circulating ghrelin in the um, lactating animals. And here, now you can see that receptor levels are increased in the arcuate nucleus, which um, is where ghrelin has its primary effect on food intake. And the receptor levels are also increased in the ventral tegmental area. Now, most of you who work on, on the brain of um, mammals will know that the ventral tegmental area is the home of a, a, the lot of dopamine cells uh, to do with reward. But when you inject ghrelin into the VTA, you get um, an increase in food intake. There's also some increase, although it's not quite significant here, it's only a trend. There's an increase in ghrelin levels in the hippocampus. There are no increases in ghrelin receptor expression in fat. So it's not that this decrease in circulating ghrelin produces a wholesale increase in receptors in every tissue there seem to be some specificity. Um, so that suggests that maybe the changes in ghrelin levels are, in ghrelin receptor levels uh, maintain sensitivity to ghrelin even when circulating levels are low and that those changes are correlated with the loss of energy to the pups rather than the hormonal state of the mother. And then just finally, am I as short as Diego? Am I as, I, am I as short as time, of time as I think I am? It's good? Okay, he can't say anything. Okay, um, so in the last set of experiments, we actually got down to the functional question, right? Um, can you influence food and, to, are lactating animals responsive to ghrelin during lactation? Um, what, it, what functionally has changed? Okay, and um, we ask this question again, focusing on day 10 and day 14 postpartum. Okay, um, because that is a, at the time at which food intake is a really at its highest. Um, and we, just compared the response of cycling animals to either ghrelin itself or a, a ghrelin antagonist. Um, on day 10, we looked only at the agonist, so we gave ghrelin and uh, we gave it for, um, we didn't want our ghrelin to compete with endogenous ghrelin. So uh, <coughs> we gave the ghrelin about four hours after lights on. So this is a time when the animals wouldn't usually eat. Um, and we gave four doses. <coughs> Radek did this experiment as part of his PhD thesis, and it really is heroic. It was a between subjects, so different animals in each of, at each of the doses. And because ghrelin has a short acting effect on our food intake, we just looked at two hour food intake, right? Lactating rats eat more in two hours than non-lactating rats as you would expect, so, um, they start off even at saline with a, um, after saline with a, a larger increase in food intake. But I think that what you can see quite clearly from this graph is that the lower doses of ghrelin produce, produced a uh, much larger effect in the lactating animals than they did in the cycling animals. Although the high doses um, produce similar effects. So it's not as though ghrelin is making a greater contribution to food intake at this point, I think, is a fair way of saying it, but rather that it produces a peak effect 
at lower doses. So we went on from the day 10 postpartum to look at um, day 14. And on day 14, the situation was a bit different. They, um, we got a bigger response in this case. This is a different design. Um, the animals, it's, it's a within subjects design and the way that we did the experiment was to give saline one day and Gorilla in the next and counterbalance the order in which we presented um, the drug. Um, we had to do that because animals are increasing their food intake over time, the lactating animal. And uh, here what we saw was a greater response to the one microgram dose. Um, and when we gave the agonist, when we gave the antagonist, we get a greater effect of the antagonist in the day 14 animals than in the cycling animals. So this again argues for some change in the contribution of ghrelin to food intake here, but it, it looks as though the situation is changing between day 10 and day 14. So it's less one of sensitivity at this point and more one of uh, ghrelin's contribution. Okay, so there's a greater response um, to exogenous administration of ghrelin, but it's of a different type and it, it's changed. So ghrelin's contribution to food intake is maybe changing across lactation as, the, um, as we get closer to peak lactation. It may also be that some of these differences are a function of when the animal is eating. Okay, either way, it's, um, it's the data as a whole suggests that the GHSR signaling does contribute to food intake during lactation um, and that it does so to a greater extent in lactating than in cycling rats. And that's consistent with increased GHSR expression in the arcuate and the ventral tegmental area, at least at the day 14 point. So overall, what I think I've shown you, what I hope I've shown you is that um, first it's very energetic, it's very expensive energetically to lactate, um, that the decreases in food intake and body weight gain that you see in our rats with a truncated form of the ghrelin receptor is, a, is consistent with um, a role for this receptor in the metabolic adaptations to lactation, um, that there is increased GH, GHSR expression in multiple brain areas, and a greater responses in lactating rats to exogenous administration of ghrelin and ghrelin antagonists. Um, and this all together supports a role for GHR signaling. Um, the bottom part of this slide, however, is just to tell you, to indicate how complicated it is to work with this particular ligand uh, receptor Comp, uh, combination, because even without its ligand, then the GHSR receptor is very happily signaling at least through um, the, the G protein part, as well as having uh, both stimulatory and inhibitory effects through G proteins. There's also a beta arrestin um, signaling pathway on the, on the receptor. Um, so life gets complicated. And then we have this other complication where the um, ghrelin can form heterodimers with all these other receptors and actually change their function. Um, so precisely how ghrelin is doing what or the ghrelin receptor is doing what we think it's doing in lactation remains to be seen. Okay.
questions. Thank you. Oh, I should first acknowledge all the people that did the work. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Thank We're you. Now going, we now have some questions. Okay. And the first one is from Giselle, and she asks. Uh, does the average body temperature of the mother decrease in postpartum during lactation? And does huddling with pups provide increased insulation that compensates for the decrease in thermogenesis? Okay, no, there's a decrease in brown fat thermogenesis, but actually the body temperature of the mother goes up. And I'm glad you asked this question because in fact, that's what my PhD thesis was on a long time ago, <laughs> right? That the, the, um, the body temperature of lactating rats actually increases because she's, there's so much metabolic activity going on, right? Um, so metabolic temperature increases and um, it is not, she's got, so from just from the cost of milk production. Okay. And she actually uses the pups in a different way. When she gets on them, they're cool and she loses body temperature to the pups. It's um, okay. And the second question is from me. And can the mothers also increase the length of lactation and maternal care depending on litter size? And if so, would a delayed development of the offspring uh, have long-term effects on the offspring in function of this increased litter size? If you increase litter size, yes, it's really, there's some really interesting work that has been done by um, lo just looking at what happens to pups that are born in small litters versus large litters. So if you're born in small, the mother doesn't, um, doesn't eat so as to raise pups of a certain size. So if you are, although she eats less, if she's got only four pups, each of those pups is fatter than a pup from a 14 pup litter. Is that clear? And you can, see that that has implications for how for the tendency of those pups to be obese when they get older right so it's a little bit like undernourished pups tend to be obese later right your mother doesn't have to be undernourished she's just you grow at a slower rate and then you tend to get fatter later on. And it's actually epigenetic changes in POMC genes. Yeah. Thank you. And the third question is from Anna Kiss. And she asks, thinking about an evolutionary approach, what will be the rationale for rats to ovulate just after giving birth? Oh, I think if you have, okay, if you have a time limited period, right, to um, to produce to reproduce, right, and really, did, I don't know what it's like in Brazil, but in North America, most rats only have one reproductive period. They are, most of them die off over the winter, right, and they don't reproduce. But there's a, the, the, old, the ones that are reproducing during the summer, we don't know a whole lot about wild rats, but the ones that reproduce, old enough to reproduce in the summer often don't make it through the winter. So if you have a postpartum ovulation, you'll delay implantation, but you'll still give birth like four weeks after you gave birth to the first litter. So you have first, you give birth to first litter one, you get impregnated that night, you give birth to litter two four weeks later. If you don't get pregnant in the postpartum estrus, you don't come into, uh, you don't ovulate again for three weeks. Then you have a three week gestation. 
So you don't have your next litter until six weeks, right? So in effect, you have, you, you're able to reproduce more <laughs> pasta by having a postpartum estrus, even if you delay implantation. And the fourth question is from Marina Martins. And she asks, the implement, implantation delay that may occur after birth is related to changing, changes in hormonal fluctuations due to birth or changes in the uterus that inhibit it? That's a really good question. Um, I think that it is most likely um, a, due to a metabolic change in the um, and the it's 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 a, probably a hormonal event, but it's a hormonal event that can be influenced by a reproductive event, right? So that the necessary circumstances for that to allow implantation, the hormones that you need for implantation, are not there because the uh, energetics have shut them down, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. The fifth question is from Mila Pamplona, and she asks if there is any type of food selection by female rodents during lactation. For example, do they prefer more lipidic or proteic food sources? We've looked at, I mean, the, the classic paper in this is a paper by Kurt Richter, that was done in 1937, so nearly a hundred years ago. And he gave uh, rats a cafeteria diet and he gave them something like 13 or 14 different um, foodstuffs. And they selected a diet that was allowed, that allowed them to, um, to raise their litters perfectly well. I think that the, um, I think that one of the things that they do do is um, they maintain a protein intake. We've done studies where we look at protein and carbohydrates and fats and have added minerals and vitamins to each type so that they're all sufficient. They don't seem to be particular whether they eat fat or whether they eat carbs, right? Um, they do try, um, try. They, they do tend to eat a balanced diet, but they, um, so they don't particularly choose for high calories. They t increase their calories by eating all all aspects, all macronutrients. Okay. The sixth question is from Carlos Tolosi, and he says, hi, Barbara, very good presentation. Is there studies regarding ghrelin and different diets such as fatty acids or amino acids with lactation? No, there isn't. Um, uh, if you'd like to try, we'd <laughs> it, would be, it would be interesting to know because ghrelin does affect largely palatable foods, right? That, um, and ghrelin sort of switches the metabolism towards carbohydrate metabolism and away from fat metabolism. That's one of the things that ghrelin does. It tends to preserve fat, it's lipogenic, um, but also it tends to preserve fat. So um, that is, it inhibits the breakdown of fat and tends to favor the metabolism of carbohydrates. And it would be interesting to see whether that would transfer into lactation, right? And we have another question from Anakis. And is there something on, on other food intake related structures besides the hypothalamus, such as the nucleus of the solitary tract 
also playing a role in those changes during pregnancy and lactation? Yeah, I think that there, that I think in lactation, what you're getting is all the cues coming in, right? And there's certainly changes in um, hindbrain structures. One of the things that uh, happens in lactation is that animals tend not to become anorectic, uh, to, tend not to be sensitive to um, some cues that would be anorectic and would come up through the nucleus of the solitary tract. So um, in part because alpha MSH, which combines with oxytocin to have an effect in the hindbrain to um, reduce food intake, that effect doesn't seem to work in lactation. Right, so um, the anorectic effects of oxytocin are less um, apparent in lactating animals. In fact, the anorectic effect of practically every anorectic hormone you can think of, including CCK, right, those effects are diminished in lactation. We have a question from Beatrice Fernandes. And are there differences in phy physiological regulations of mother's food intake related to seasonality cycling? For example, if you compare rodent species that don't hibernate with species that hibernate. Yes, I mean, that's, an, that's a good question and an interesting question, right? I mean, it depends when they're going to give birth relative to the hibernation, right? So, um, so when you think of golden hamsters hibernate, I believe, um, they have a very different reproductive physiology, right? Um, they have also a much shorter pregnancy. Uh, their pregnancy lasts about 15 days. So, um, and they deal with the whole food availability problem much differently. If they feel that they don't, if they don't have enough food, they just eat a baby and um, right, they cannibalize. Um, the other hamsters, the Siberian hamsters are another different ecology. They are, they have huge stores of food. Um, and so there's two, two ways of going about it. Uh, they, they have two reproductive strategies. There's one of the um, species of Siberian hamsters that is uh, monogamous. So the dad helps to uh, provide food for the mom to feed the babies. He doesn't lactate, but he also looks after the babies. Um, so he shows paternal care. And then there are other, the uh, Sangoras, which is uh, the female alone looks after the offspring. She has huge, um, she has huge stores of food. So there are lots of different ways of dealing with this, right? Some species, I don't know if anyone in your group uh, studies seals, but there are some species of seals that put on humongous amounts of fat during pregnancy and then don't eat at all during lactation. They have a short lactation, one baby, the baby attaches to the nipple and then virtually doesn't leave for <laughs> the nipple for uh, several weeks, two or three weeks at least. And the mother just lies on the beach and it's like moving energy, like pressing down the mother and watching the, the seal pup get bigger, right? So there are multiple ways of solving this issue, right? And it, because it has to do also with the, how optrical the offspring are when they're born, yeah. We have another question from Patricia Tarcinardi and she asks, does the, does imposed food restriction have similar effects on lactation, pups growth and anovulation as the ones observed in ghrelin knockout animals? 
we've not tried that. I think that would be a great thing to do. I, I really, um, I'm really interested in the lactational anovulation story. Uh, we know we were able to prolong it with food restriction. We've never been able to find a cue that gets to stop the prolongation. Um, I think it would be interesting to do it. Now at Carlton, what Alfonso has done is to back cross the fawn hooded uh, mutants onto a Wistar background. So then we have a much, I think a much more stable background. The fawn hooded animals have a little, are a little funky. They tend to be a bit skinny. Um, so now that they're on a Wistar background, I think we can really ask questions that we couldn't or didn't feel comfortable asking before. We have a question from Lenny Gomez. Uh, this is a big one, so let me make sure I get this right. Uh, what are the metabolic consequences that occur during the development of ghrelin knockout females? And could these metabolic consequences affect energy balance of these females during reproduction and lactation? For example, not allowing for enough fat reserves. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly, I think this is the problem. It, it's, this is a problem. And this is why we had so many alternate strategies, right? The problem when you're dealing with any knockout is that, or mutant, they're knocked out a mutant or muted or a mutant from embryonic life on. So, and I actually on the slide I stepped through, I actually said this, that the, there are presumably all sorts of compensatory mechanisms that come into play during development. I mean, it's just a fact of life if we're going to deal with these uh, genetic manipulations, right? Um, so yes, there could be, there could have been all sorts of compensatory mechanisms so that make the chances of seeing any effect in adulthood much, uh, much lower, right? Uh, we're not, we're, it's going to be hard to see them necessarily. Um, so the fact that we got something, I think, was a bit, and something that sort of went into the direction that made sense, um, I think is a reasonable, um, was, was quite, was quite nice actually. Um, but it is a problem. And so what, then you need to switch, switch strategies and be able to look at conditional knockdowns, right? Using some sort of viral vector. But if you do that, you've got to know where you think it's going to happen. Okay, so which bit of the brain, you know, you can't sort of, uh, so, and when we're looking at something that's as multiply determined as food intake, we could try the ocuate. I guess that would be the first place to try. I mean, we do have the, um, we do have the, uh, the mice now that it means working with mice. Um, so there'd be a lot of background information that you'd have to get but uh, yeah that's that he's exactly right the um it's working with knockouts is a problem uh, another question from marina martins uh grilling and administration during lactation uh, could affect maternal uh, let me rephrase could could grilling administration during lactation affect maternal care maternal care for example how much time the mother spends with the pups nursing or eating? Yeah, we haven't done that after Gorellan administration, um, but we did look at maternal care in the uh, mutant animals, in the knockouts. And we looked at how much time they spent with their babies on day 10, day 15, day 20, and we looked at how often they groom their babies and we did eight hours in the light and eight hours in the night. And uh, as I scored most of the things blind, um, my eyes were out on sticks looking at the videotapes. And the bottom line was we saw no difference in maternal behavior in the major things that we looked at. One thing that was different that, um, 
that seems that, and it's only really preliminary and pilot. Uh, one of the students did a study where they looked at retrieval behavior and they did a home cage retrieval test and a novel cage retrieval test. And what we saw was that they te the knockouts tended to be slower at retrieving in the novel cage. We have two questions from Gustavo Venancio. And the first one is, is it possible that different, the difference in maternal weight gain between the knockout mums and slash wild type pups and knockout mums and knockout pups is related to something in mother pup signals? Yeah, I, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we looked at maternal behavior. We were actually thinking, oh, maybe she just doesn't spend as much time with their babies, right? Um, but it's, but no, they spend just as much time and they, not only do they spend overall as much time, but nest bout length is the same. It's not that they are doing lots of little visits so they can't have, deliver milk. Um, no, that was, uh, I would have liked to have seen, uh, an effect on maternal behavior actually, but there was none there no matter how hard I looked. And the second question from Gustavo is, is there a well-established mechanism by which the NPY and PRAG neuron population expands in the arcuate nucleus during lactation reps? Um, it seems to be largely an effect of prolactin. Okay. Um, so that the prolactin secreted in response to suckling during lactation um, plays a major role in increasing food intake. Um, and it also, if you, you can see an effect of prolactin on those MPY-AGRP neurons, right? So you can get an increase in MPY just from suckling, just from nursing the pups before you get any um, letdown of milk. So it seems as though that I, the energy loss increases MPY, right? MPY goes up if you lose weight, MPY goes up. But um, it also is facilitated by the uh, increased prolactin release during lactation. And certainly that NPY in the DMH in the dorsal medial hypothalamus is a prolactin mediated effect. Exactly how prolactin does it, it's not clear because there are prolactin receptors in the arcuate, but they're not on NPY neurons. So, <laughs> magic. So that was the last question. And with that, we can now end uh, the session. And I would like to thank, very, you, thank you very much once again for taking your time to join us and for the wonderful talk and discussion. And I will also like to thank everyone who watched the transmission today, as well as everyone who may watch it in the future when it's available on YouTube. And make sure to follow us uh, on our channel and stay tuned for future FIDO webinars in the following years with different researchers from all over the world presenting the research on animal physiology and its intersections with different areas of research. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.